Good morning. You are with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Uh, we are gathered here this morning before we go to the floor uh, in order to consider amendments uh, to S25, um, an act relating to miscellaneous cannabis regulation procedures. Um, we have a ways and means amendment um, that will be going uh, up early today, but I don't see the reporter from ways and means here yet. So I'm gonna invite representative Gannon to, uh, to just share with the committee the sort of technical amendment and, and the origin of that, that we are gonna uh, present here, hopefully as a friendly amendment in committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so the amendment that I'm proposing um, only amends a single section of um, S25, which is section 17, um, which deals with the Vermont Criminal Justice Council and the A-Ride training. Um, I initially proposed um, taking out a report that would have required the Vermont Criminal Justice Council to come back to us um, with the amount of funds it would, it would be needed to require um, all law enforcement officers to receive a ride training um, December 31st, 2021, um, because I was working with the council and thought that we could um, come up with uh, a cost and um, some information on which officers um, still needed training. And just for background for everybody, um, any officer who is certified after um, 2015 is required to get a ride training and they get it 36 months after they finish in the police academy. Um, so th those folks are gonna get the training no matter what. Um, the question th that came up was that there are officers who are certified before that date and how fast they could be brought in. And that raised a couple of other questions, which is, do all of those officers need to be uh, received the A-Ride training? And, and the, the council pushed back or, or suggested that there were certain officers who may have trouble meeting the prerequisites um, for A-Ride training. And the example they gave were the, exam were the investigators for the Office of Professional Regulation. Um, clearly, they do not do roadside stops at all and, and may not be able to pass the prerequisite for for a right training, which is the standardized field sobriety test. They have to show a competence in that. Um, so the council and I were trying to work out which types of law enforcement officers might not be able to meet that requirement, but we were unable to. Um, so what I propose in my amendment is that we go back um, to have the council report on the funding requirement and also make a recommendation as to which law enforcement officers, if any, should not be required to receive the A-Ride training because those officers do not make roadside stops or those officers would not be proficient in the standardized field sobriety test that is a prere prerequisite of A-Ride training um, because of their law enforcement position or training. Questions from committee members. <clears throat> um, Representative Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Representative Gannon, uh, so are you talking about the enforcement folks that OPR are considered law enforcement officers? Yes, they are. Wow, uh, that's news to me. <laughs> um, and I guess the other question I've got is, did you say, 36 months after they complete training? That, or after they complete their level three certification. And the reason for that is they want to make sure that those officers have had experience with road, roadside stops, um, working with other officers who are either trained um, in A-Ride or in the DRE program so that they have some experience before they go through the A-Ride training. Okay, thanks. Any other questions from committee members? All right, um, uh, Representative Anthony. Not a question, Madam uh, Chair, but I was going to make a motion if it's appropriate. Um, I think what I'd like to do is hear all of the, the amendments and then we can um, take votes on them after our um, our two missing committee members are able to get here because they have um, they have a standing nine o'clock meeting, so they won't be here for a few more minutes. But thank you. Hold that thought. 
<laughs> All right. Um, so since we have not um, seen Representative Beck yet, but that I um, expect we'll hear from him shortly, I think I would like to invite uh, Representative Peterson to Im introduce the concepts around his amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, committee, for taking your time today to, to listen to uh, my amendment. Uh, this is a first for me as a new representative. Um, my amendment is to section one of the bill, and, and uh, if you want to look uh, read along with it, it's uh, page 2602 of today's uh, House calendar, right at the top of the page. And it, it's relatively simple. Pretty much what it does is uh, expand the opt-in for cannabis. Right now, the, the law reads that the opt-in is for retail and retail only. Uh, but I would, like to, I, I would like to add cultivator, wholesaler, product manufacturer, and test laboratories to that. Um, the reason being, I, I feel that cannabis is, is set apart from other things we grow. Okay, uh, I, I think that the town should have local control. The town people should have local control of what a product like this growing in their town. Uh, we, we, the, the law states or the requirements state that, that a, a marijuana field will be enclosed, uh, kept away from the public, and, and, and uh, fenced in. And to me, as a, as a taxpayer in a town, um, I would want to know whether that type of operation is in my town. So uh, it's all about local control on this. Um, I did some research about economic, I mean, uh, environmental impact of growing marijuana, growing cannabis. Uh, I think above, above and beyond anything else is the smell. Uh, I don't know how many of you have been around a hemp field uh, but there's a distinct and pervasive skunk smell um, that, you know, many find very offensive. Um, that smell uh, is one uh, environmental factor. But there's been a number of studies done, and I did a fair amount of research. Uh, energy consumption around indoor, indoor grows is very high. Water consumption, they, they uh, say that a marijuana plant uh, consume six gallons of water a day. When you extrapolate that out over a field, that's an awful lot of water. Um, indoor uh, grows uh, experience uh, air pollution to the point where workers' safety is at, at risk. Uh, and, and probably the biggest thing I found in my research about the environmental impact is there's a lot of unknowns uh, leaching into leaching into uh, waterways. Um, um, impact on wildlife, impact on soil. I don't think, it doesn't sound like many people have done many studies on that. So there's a lot of unknowns. Um, but, you know, I get back to the fact that uh, cannabis is illegal federally. It's illegal to grow federally. Uh, 31 states presently offer licenses. Uh, but in the end, I think that town should, should have an opt-in for these types of operations. So that's why I'm proposing the amendment. Questions from committee members? Representative Hooper. Uh, thank you for coming, Representative Peterson. I, I, you mentioned a couple times in your presentation about indoor grow. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. I, I saw that lean in there. Yeah, uh, I'm hard, a little hard of hearing, so I do lean in a little. <laughs> so I'll, re I'll relate to you an interesting story from last term where uh, when we were considering the, the pot bill, we did a couple of tours of facilities and uh, a person on the committee uh, remarked when we were in the middle of one indoor grow facility, which I was very impressed with, um, that he didn't even know it was there and it was in his town. And he happened to be the chief of police. So uh, um, it, it's interesting, the, the juxtaposition of, of those experiences that you bring forward. Um, and I just thought I had to relate that 
Thanks. Well, thank you. Representative Marwicki. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, well, from where I'm sitting right now, um, I could probably take a baseball and, and throw it to the dairy farm down the road from me. And they're spreading manure today, so I know which way the wind is blowing. And, and I hear your concerns about odors, but are, are we, are we going to start setting a precedent that uh, agriculture is going to have to uh, clean up the smells? Well, I, Representative, I, I, I hear that concern, and I know you live in Putney, and, I, and I've been to Putney many times and, and know of another facility there that definitely has an odor, too. Um, no, but when it's pervasive all the time, um, it, it, it is one factor. It's, I'm not saying that we shouldn't allow these grows, but I think towns should be able to opt in. Now, when we did the retail opt in this past year, a number of towns agreed to, to allow retailers. Those same towns probably would, wouldn't mind having a grow, having a manufacturing facility. It doesn't restrict it. It just gives the, gives the, the taxpayer, the voter say in what, what type of facility like this could operate in their town. Thank you. And, and if you are referring to the, to the paper mill in Putney, I would say that they have done a lot of work over the years and the, the sulfur rotten egg smell that used to be pervasive in the village sometimes is pretty rare if ever. And I can't remember it happening in the last few years. So I want to give them credit well, for uh, taking care. I would give them a lot of credit because when I was there years ago working with the phone company, it was, it was quite different. Representative Gannon. Um, thank you, Representative Peterson, for, for bringing this amendment to us. Um, you know, one of the priorities in Act 164 um, was to reduce the illicit market in cannabis. And part of that effort um, was to bring small illicit cultivators into the regulated market. Uh, my concern with your amendment is that those cultivators are already out there in towns and cities around Vermont. <laughs> Um, if a town was to prohibit cultivation, um, then those growers would remain in the illicit market and negatively impact our ability to move those growers into the legal market and provide a regulated product that's tested. H how do you address that? Um, if, if they're growing now, you're saying they're growing now? Yes. Illegally? Yes. I mean, if you're, if you're illegal in what you do, then I, I, I don't have an answer for that. Illegal is illegal, I guess. I mean, um, if, if, a, if you're operating illegally in a town and the town votes to not allow a grow, um, I guess you're illegal and you should stop. Well, it's unlikely they will. They'll probably continue to grow. Um, and that's, that's my concern, is that our goal is to try to bring those small illegal cultivators into the regulated market. And by allowing towns to prohibit them um, from getting yeah. into the market, um, it will really harm our ability to reduce um, the legal market, the illegal market. Well, I hear your concern. I, I... I don't have a great answer for that. Um, I, I don't know how much of that goes on, uh, but uh, if you're growing illegally, it's illegal. That's all. That's that my simple mind. I mean, that's that's the way I look at it. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Any other questions for Representative Peterson? All right, uh, welcome Representative Beck. Thank you for being here. Um, 
We are running through each of the amendments that are being proposed to S25. And so you are here on behalf of the Ways and Means Committee. And I wanted to give you a few moments to talk conceptually about uh, what your amendment does. And then if you'd like to, we can ask legislative council to go through the, uh, the text of it if, it's, if, if you would like that. Okay, sure. Let me um, just go into it here in the calendar just to, so I can speak to the, Okay, so the um, basically in a nutshell, what we've done here, what Ways and Means did, is we took all of the um, fee work that was proposed, um, and we've we've put that to the Cannabis Control Board to make recommendations to the legislature to House Ways and Means. Um, I think the date was it is October first. And the only fee we really took, the only fee we took action on was the integrated license, um, which in the, uh, what we received was 3% of gross sales up to a, a maximum contribution of 50,000 per integrated license, and instead put in just a one-time contribution of $50,000 per integrated license. Our um, logic there was that anybody that would be applying for this integrated license is somebody that is well capitalized and we should just cut to the chase and just make that a $50,000 fee. And that is really the, the gist of the House Ways and, mean, we, Ways and Means Amendment. Any questions for Representative Beck? All right, Mr. Vice Chair, you spent some time. Um, oh, and we have Legislative Council, Mel Michelle Childs. Thank you. Sorry, I, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I did just want to mention there was one other small amendment, which was elimination of the advertising review fee. And I'm sorry, and Representative Beck might have mentioned that, and I might have missed it. Yeah, thank you, Michelle. I did not mention that specifically, but yeah, we basically, all fees, including the advertising fee, um, to wait for recommendations from the cannabis control group in October. Actually, on the advertising review, you took out the ability for them to establish one, so they won't re be reporting on the advertising review fees. So those are those are totally out of the bill. Oh, okay. I think yeah, you're right. You're right. Yep. That is something that I would love to understand a little bit more of. Um, and I don't know, Representative Beck, if you were part of deliberations in committee that, that led to that, or Representative Gannon, if you were there when, when the group was discussing that, I would love to understand why, um, why that fee was eliminated altogether, because one of the, one of the aspects of the advertising restrictions that we felt we should put on cannabis establishments was that um, uh, that the cannabis control board would have the ability to review advertising to to ensure that it complies with our restrictions and uh, and in order to compensate for that we allowed the cannabis control board to set an advertising fee. So I'm just curious what the rationale was for eliminating that. I. I'm probably not the best person to speak on that. I'm not sure if Representative Gannon recalls that conversation or not. Go ahead, Representative Gannon. Uh, so, um, Madam Chair, um, this the elimination of the advertising fees was an amendment proposed by Representative Kornheiser. Um, and I believe her, her logic was that um, she felt that it was an additional fee that could um, make it that could add up over time because her concern was that every time you changed one word in say an internet ad or some other ad, it would be an additional cost um, to cannabis establishments. Um, and she thought that that burden would be too high. Thank you. Uh, Representative Higley. Thank you. Uh, Representative Beck, what was the committee vote on that amendment? 9-1-1. Thank you. All right, any other questions from committee members? 
uh, with respect to the Ways and Means Amendment. We understand it conceptually. Do committee members want to um, go, go through the language of the Ways and Means Amendment together here? Or have you all been looking at it while I've been watching committee discussion? Uh, Representative Hooper. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I concur that, uh, you know, part of the way that we're seeking to fund the commission is through fees for their activity. So cutting that advertising fee, although the logic of incremental changes is probably valid, I would think they would be able to set a pricing structure um, that might reflect the time that they invest in what they're doing for each individual person. But I, I specifically want to hear about how the flat fee of $50,000 would impact uh, small boutique type uh, growers and marketers as opposed to the 3% um, if that was considered and if it's uh, of any concern. Thank you. Yeah, I, I can speak to that. Um, thank you. So it was our, in our conversation, um, we don't believe that a, a small or a boutique would be even be seeking an integrated license um, to be a, a grower, a cultivator, a processor, and a retailer. The only people that would really be pursuing these types of licenses would be would be big operators, people that are that are capitalized far beyond what a little boutique um, seller or grower would would be thinking of doing. Ben and Jerry started as a boutique ice cream maker. So that's sort of the root of my question. Representative Gannon, did you want to respond to that? Yes, um, I, I just want to remind members um, that in Act 164, only the existing medical dispensaries are allowed to apply for integrated licenses. Um, I think most of them are, are significant operations that there was testimony in House Ways and Means about that. That question, as Representative Beck mentioned, was raised. Um, but those are the only applicants um, for the integrated licenses. So there won't be boutique um, entities um, applying um, for an integrated license. Thank you, John. Representative Anthony. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, would uh, really regret completely removing the advertising fee. I'm sure that some language could be crafted so that in essence, it would be perhaps a one-time uh, upfront when the license is issued and or uh, an annual review or something like that, rather than worrying over a change in a preposition uh, triggering another fee. I, 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 there must be a way to wordsmith that. Thank you. Representative Gannon. Um, I think another thought that Representative Kornheiser had with respect to this um, elimination of the advertising fee is that those fees could, baked, be, could be baked into the existing licensing fees. Um, and so that, well, we might lose an advertising fee per se, um, the consideration of the cost of reviewing advertising could be taken into consideration in establishing the various licensing fees. All right, any other questions uh, with respect to the Ways and Means Amendments? Representative LeClaire. Uh, good morning, and I'm sorry I arrived a little bit late. So I'm, I guess this is uh, geared towards our resident cannabis expert here. Um, I'm just curious about the change in timelines as far as the, uh, the fee structure reporting Based on what we heard from the chair of the Cannabis Control Board, are are they still going to be able to have the information they need when they need it to do what they need to do? Um, the the testimony, um, well, I shouldn't say the testimony. I, I mean the, the the discussion in House Ways and Means. Um, the chair, um, while well, she had not yet asked the speaker to do this, was willing to have House Ways and Means come in early. Um, before the session started to start reviewing these fees um, so that they would be able to take action early in the next session um, with respect to them. Uh, I mean, we, 
there is a tight timeline. There has always been a tight timeline, um, even under Act 164. Um, so it, it, it is challenging, um, but um, I think Ways and Means was confident that they could get this done. And if Representative Beck has anything to add. Um, I don't have anything to add to that. Yeah, that is the, the chair's um, has, she has some, um, um, inform this inform the speaker that um, that she would like to um, have meetings in the fall um, based on these fees that are recommended by the cannabis control board so that when we arrive in early January that we're we're ready to act quickly I have to say that that's a little discomforting that we're depending depending on a committee to come in and out of session to meet specifically around this one issue, but okay, as long as the commitment's there. All right, any other questions with respect to the Ways and Means Amendment? All right, uh, Representative Donahue. Morning, uh, thank you for your time this morning. Um, for those who were here last year, um, you might recall that we had a conversation around the fact that our public policy in this legislation um, was sort of targeted, I think, at two main areas. One was to um, bring people out of the black market, uh, maybe not eliminate it, but reduce the black market and have a, um, a regulated licit market, um, and also safety for users. Um, folks are using cannabis, um, but they don't know the potency, they don't know the purity or quality. Um, and so introducing a um, regulated market uh, made sense. Um, I think for some people making money was a goal. I, I don't think it was a primary goal, but certainly our, one of our public policy goals was not to encourage um, use, not to have people who um, didn't use before or increase consumption in, in various ways. Um, and this committee at the time ended up, um, I believe it was a unanimous vote, um, supporting uh, an amendment I offered at that time to ban um, all advertising as being contrary um, to those public policy goals. And the House adopted that amendment, um, again, I believe unanimously. And unfortunately, um, it was lost as, I think, one of the very final pieces um, in the negotiations with the Senate. Um, and I know that, uh, that one of their big concerns was the concern about uh, its constitutionality as a total ban. And certainly the laws very mixed on that, or there's a very incomplete record because there haven't been that many uh, legal markets. So the question of whether you can ban advertising if it's federally illegal versus if the state has made it legal, then it uh, fits within the standards for um, uh, bans on free speech to be closely tied to, um, to goals. And in, in this case, it was focused on uh, Used by children, um, but that's um, that's the background be between uh, to returning this year to suggest not a total ban, but to suggest uh, narrowly and solely that we don't want to see advertising used for the purpose of encouraging consumption, um, while leaving it completely open for what the majority of advertising is for, and that is promoting one's own, um, one's own market, one's own uh, sales. So uh, advertising that we have the best quality, uh, we have the best prices, we have a sale this week. Um, we, uh, you know, any of those things that are promoting one's own, uh, the benefits of, of shopping or buying um, versus directly encouraging uh, consumption, uh, which is not a goal of the legislation. And, and uh, 
so um, I think that's that's what I'm focusing on um, with the help of uh, legislative council um, was able to do some refining to help uh, draw that line and of course um, I don't need to tell you but it's it's the rulemaking process that will work that through in more detail um, but what it does is is it changes the um, the ban on advertising that promotes overconsumption, which would probably be a kind of tough thing anyway in, in rulemaking to sort out what, what that meant, but, but it changes that to um, banning encouraging consumption um, and to make it consistent with the definition of advertising, it clarifies that uh, inducing sales, which is permitted, is inducing sales for that licensee. So come by at my place if you're buying because um, here, are the, here are the reasons um, that I can meet your needs the best. So, so that's the basics. Um, obviously, it was, a, it was a big disappointment to me um, when uh, when the uh, Senate wouldn't back off, or actually I watched the back and forth and at one point it was on their list of things they were willing to concede and then it got pulled back. Uh, we also lost something that was in existing law in terms of the health department warnings uh, that were eradicated even for um, existing uh, cannabis for symptom release um, in, in the final uh, version. Um, so I think this is a, a much narrower, much more focused way of addressing our public policy goals in permitting advertising, um, but carving out that encouragement of consumption from what is permitted advertising. Questions from committee members for Representative Donahue. Representative Anthony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Donahue, had you considered trying to not only limit the uh, focus of the advertising to the retail shop come by mine as you, as you intimated, but also reaching through the supply chain and, and somehow accomplishing your original goal by preventing advertisement uh, by any but the retail establishment? Did, did, you, did you consider that possibility or, or is it just axiomatic that it's the retailer that you're worried about promotion of uh, indulgence? Thank you. Well, uh, my understanding is this section of the, of the bill of, of the law is about um, any kind of advertising. Um, that, that anyone is doing. So it addresses equally if the advertising encourages consumption um, at any of those levels, in, including a retail establishment. Um, if it's something other than promoting that establishment's um, benefits in, in the market, benefits to the, to the consumer to, um, to go to. All right, any other questions from committee members? I, I have to say uh, the thing that really caught my eye and um, what was seeing this, the encourages consumption um, replaces uh, the existing language which says uh, promotes overconsumption. And um, when I saw that, I sort of thought, um, how low a bar, <laughs> how low a bar can, can we go to in terms of um, policy on, on this being sort of at its core a harm reduction um, approach of um, we, we, want, we want users to be safe. Uh, we want the market, uh, we want the black market to be discouraged, um, but we're not trying to encourage um, more use. We're not trying to encourage this as a as a good product. Um, you know, we think of similar uh, similar products, uh, tobacco, alcohol, um, similar products where there are concerns, 
And those likewise are not things that we um, have advertising that would encourage more use. All right, so we have um, with us David Schur from the Attorney General's Office. And uh, thank you, David, for joining us this morning. Um, some of the conversations around advertising restrictions um, have, have really been prompted by, uh, by the Attorney General's concern about a total ban on advertising. And so I wanted to um, welcome you to share your thoughts on where the, this language fits in um, with the advertising restrictions that, uh, that, that your office um, expressed support for um, being the, the original house government operations uh, restrictions. So welcome and thank you for being with us. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you for having me this morning. I haven't had a huge amount of time to review, but I will give you some remarks just on the, again, approaching this from a litigation, potential litigation standpoint. <clears throat> um, as I mentioned before, and as Representative Donahue correctly uh, notes, there are there is some split uh, authority out there as to whether or not standard First Amendment principles will apply. But as I testified before, we do think there's a reasonable likelihood that it will, and it's our view that we should uh, craft restrictions that are likely to withstand that scrutiny for a number of reasons that we spoke about before, uh, including that if you end up striking down too many restrictions, Vermont could be, end, uh, or if the court ends up striking down a restriction, um, Vermont could be left in a worse place than uh, having some restrictions that remain. In other words, if there's if there's not, if there are no limitations left for the board to uh, make its decisions in accordance with, then it's not a great situation and it really opens the door. So it's our view that we should be trying to craft, uh, or I should say that it is, we are in the safest position litigation wise to try to craft um, restrictions that are likely to withstand First Amendment scrutiny. And as we discussed before, that does happen under the central Hudson test. And I'll just say one other thing about that scrutiny. You know, of course, we're dealing with very limited precedent with respect to whether or not central Hudson applies. And again, central Hudson is the court case that dictates how courts look at the regulation of commercial speech. And I would also say that even though we have limited case law that's directly on point, we do have some other case law that talks about how courts look at advertising that's happening in two different jurisdictions. And so, for example, something that's lawful in one jurisdiction, uh, somebody who's based there is um, offering for sale something that is, or for purchase, something that's lawful in one jurisdiction is allowed under Supreme Court precedent to advertise those things in other jurisdictions where it may be unlawful. As long as where the speech is taking, or I should say, as long as where the commercial enterprise is taking place is lawful, the court has held that Central Hudson applies. And so that's not directly analogous because we're not talking about two different jurisdictions here. We're talking about federal and state, which are kind of coexisting jurisdiction. So I don't want to overstate our reliance on that, but I do think it's an indicator that um, you know, state courts and, and potentially federal courts as well could end up deciding that Central Hudson test applies. And, and again, the more recent precedent that directly is on point did choose to apply the Central Hudson test. So moving ahead to that test and sort of uh, trying to do a quick analysis here of reviewing whether or not this is likely to withstand it. You know, we, we look at those three, the, the three remaining prongs. We just discussed the first prong uh, regarding lawful activity. And again, we acknowledge that that's a bit of a, um, we're not entirely sure, but we think there's a re reasonable likelihood that it will apply. You know, does this advance a, a governmental and a substantial governmental interest? We have understood the policy interest that's being advanced here to be with respect to health and safety and especially uh, an especially powerful governmental interest with respect to young people, the consumption by young people. Um, we look then to whether the regulation directly advances that governmental interest. 
And finally, we look at whether the regulation is not more expensive than extensive than is necessary to serve that interest. When we look at this amendment, certainly I think that the first two of those three prongs are met. We are, you know, it's certainly a, a very dramatic limitation on um, any advertising that encourages consumption. Um, and I'll talk more in a minute about what that might mean in reality. But I just speaking generally right now, I don't think we need to go into this for the discussion on these first two prongs. Certainly, you know, it would advance you know, the government. We, we are going to assume that a court will find, I think it is, we are in, on safe ground asserting that a court is likely to find that the governmental interest is substantial here, as we already talked about. And of course, a dramatic limitation on advertising does advance that governmental interest. But it's the final prong where we often run into trouble on a lot of these potential regulations. This is the most sensitive one, the most difficult one to meet, and the one that um, Washington State failed at, at when um, Washington State was deciding whether some of their regulations were overly extensive. And that is whether the regulation is more extensive than is necessary to meet the governmental interest. And I think here, it's our, it would be our view that this is likely to be struck down under prong four of the central Hudson test. Uh, essentially what we're saying here is, that, is not that these things are tailored to, it's no longer that these things are tailored to the public health interests that we're most concerned about. And I'm talking here about the, um, uh, the second and third amendments and Representative Donahue's amendment proposal for, I'll talk about those first, then return to the first one. Uh, you know, so speaking about replacing the subdivision two with encourages consumption. You know, I think that as as the bills originally drafted, as we talked about, those put, per, um, current restrictions are more directly and more tightly related to issues of health and issues of youthful consumption and again, overconsumption, which is clearly a health issue. But when we go into talking about consumption generally, I think a court is likely to say that, hey, all sales are about consumption ultimately. And to try that, that's what you're doing when you're advertising this product, you're advertising it for consumption. And the state of Vermont has already said, you know, before the passage of this law, that, that possession and consumption are lawful activities. They decriminalize it and then made it legal. Um, and, and now we are saying that the sale itself is also legal under this statute. So I think a ban on or a prohibition on any advertisement that encourages consumption at all, I think, will likely be viewed by a court as saying, well, that's just a ban on any advertising. Uh, and I don't know how a court could, and, and I think a court would say, I don't know how we can draw the line between advertising that encourages consumption and advertising that encourages just the sale or something like that. I think that would require some sort of belief that the sales are not related to consumption, but I think that would be like saying, well, a motorcycle store saying that there's a sale on motorcycles this week is assuming that you're gonna buy the motorcycle without driving it. Uh, and I just don't think that that's a leap that the courts are going to take. And so we, we do think that encourages consumption, well, any advertising for the product is inevitably encouraging consumption. And so essentially that th this is, you, you know, there's, that's the point of the sale. And so essentially this is, um, going to be a, a, it's gonna prevent, I think all advertising. And I think it will likely be struck down under prong four of the central Hudson test as doing more than is necessary to advance the governmental interest. Again, the state of Vermont has decided that uh, possession and consumption are allowable. Um, I think representative Donahue's um, interest in this is laudable in terms of not uh, expanding activity uh, unnecessarily. But I think that the policy decision has already been made by the state that we are going to make this lawful and we are going to make the sale legal. And once that policy decision has been made, 
Um, I think we are now creating a regulation that is more extensive and that a court would likely find under prong four of Central Hudson is more extensive than is necessary to um, advance the governmental interest because it does more than just focus on health and you know, the particular concerns around health and youthful consumption and now just says, well, all consumption essentially were disfavoring. And that is beyond the governmental interest because Vermont's already decided that it doesn't have a governmental interest in prohibiting consumption. So prohibiting um, advertising that promotes consumption, I think is beyond the uh, governmental interest. So I think this would be likely, it's our view that this would be likely to fail court scrutiny under Central Hudson. And then the state of Vermont, or I should say really the board at that point would be left with very little uh, in terms of guidance about what it could or could not regulate. It would be left with the guidance around not advertising products that are likely to be, be, to be viewed um, or where the audience is likely to be more than 15% uh, of people under 21. And then it would have a couple of um, it, uh, you know, points around warnings and so forth. But otherwise, it would have to approve, you know, it wouldn't have any limitations on what it could, on what it could approve if it did, if the court strikes it down, and then people start advertising uh, around things that do depict people under 21. Well, it may not be able to be seen by a percentage of people under 21. But you still have advertising out there that that uh, has that in there, it could promote overconsumption and so forth. So I think, Vermont is potentially in a worse place, at least for a time, until the legislature can come back and cure it. So we do think that this puts us, you know, the state of Vermont in a tough litigation position. Uh, we do think it's not likely to withstand scrutiny under Central Hudson. Uh, and that would be our sort of legal take on, on a likely litigation outcome uh, on this. But with all due respect to Representative Donahue's efforts here, um, and we understand where she's coming from, but that's our sort of take on where the court is likely to end up. And we do think it leaves the board and ultimately the state of Vermont in a, could leave the board in the state of Vermont in a less advantageous position with respect to protecting health and safety. Thank you. Uh, Representative Anthony. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you for your presentation. Um, I want to go back to a question I asked, and, and Representative Donahue observed that the advertising section is quiet in terms of who has what standard to comply uh, in terms of the supply chain from the grower to the retailer. And I guess I want to first make an observation with which I think you agree. Part of the legislation is as much focused as you uh, intimated on the kind of quality control, that is to say, consumer would then know what they're getting as opposed to in the black market, because we have the insistence that the product be tested, we have a laboratory requirement, et cetera, et cetera. Where I'm going with this is to ask you if your conclusion and your analysis would be the same in respect to advertising, if we were talking about growers, versus retailers. And back to my supply chain query about whether or not courts would distinguish between somebody who's simply growing and selling to myriad uh, distributors, batchers, et cetera, versus uh, the usual tobacco problem, which is it's the retailer uh, who's the public face, if you will, of that commodity. Do you have a, a sense as to whether the analysis changed or your conclusion changes if we shift up the supply chain from retailers back towards the origin of the crop? Thanks. With an interesting question, Representative. And my initial, my, without having thought about that a lot specifically, I, I, do, I don't think it would change. I think that Let's assume that there's a grower out there who is very proud of their product. They think that they are growing a better product than anybody else, and it's available in many retail stores around the state. Um, they could certainly advertise uh, their particular product and say, you know, available at a fine cannabis retailer near you. And I do think that that would be 
an advertisement under the definitions that we have here because it's calculated to induce sales of the product. Uh, and I think it would be subject to the same regulation uh, as I understand it in the, um, uh, as it's been laid out in this statute. My question is, would it be subject to the same court test? Equal scrutiny, retailer yes, versus I, broker. Okay. I believe, yes, I believe that would be commercial speech and subject to the same, um, to the same test. Representative LeClaire has a question. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, good morning, David. Um, a, a question I have would be, uh, because this is still considered illegal at the federal level, um, uh, are the same standards, would the same standards be held to this as they would if you had some other commodity that was legal regardless of state federal, whatever, um, does that change things at all? Could it change things at all? Yeah, that's, a, that's an important question. And we think this is likely to be, and again, this is, we have to make some assessments here. We think this is likely to be an on or off switch. In other words, I, I think that either a court will decide that either central Hudson and all the federal precedent around and nationwide precedent around commercial speech and the regulation of commercial speech will apply, or a court could decide that it doesn't apply, in which case the state has a free hand to regulate in whatever way it sees fit. I, I would be surprised, I think we would all be surprised if a court said, well, we're gonna take some hybrid of that and um, try to thread the needle in some new, invent a new way. That's certainly possible, uh, but I, that hasn't happened yet in the cases where uh, this has been decided. And I think that would, that would be such a difficult task for a court. My guess is that they are much more likely to treat this as an on or off switch. Either the, stan the standard commercial speech principles apply or they don't. Uh, follow up question, Madam Chair. So uh, with that in mind, does it matter as to which court venue something like this would be heard in, in other words, state court versus a federal court. And if we were talking about different venues, would different um, standards be applied? Or are they all gonna be under one standard? Right, in terms of the basic First Amendment principles, I, I think either, you know, whether it's state or federal, they will apply the same, well, they will apply the same decision-making rubric around you know, whether the First Amendment applies and then go through the test in the same way. So they're not gonna apply different principles. Is, is there a chance that they might view the question differently? Is one venue more likely to find it that First Amendment principles apply and the other is not? Um, I think that's possible, but that's it'd be very speculative of me to try to make a guess about which venue is gonna be more friendly to Vermont's regulatory scheme. But in terms of the basic, um, set of principles, that's going to be applied the same way in both courts with respect to First Amendment analysis. Thank you. All right, committee, any other questions for Assistant Attorney General Schur? Representative Donahue. Um, thank you. Um, with, with Equal, equal due respect <laughs> for the Assistant Attorney General. I, I would like to just respond to a, a few things. First of all, just as an aside, this is not the same as the initial, as, as the, house, uh, the house position. It, it is more lenient in at least some ways. Um, so, but, but in terms of the core issue, which is likely um, litigation, um, I jotted down one of the things um, that he said was the safest position. So one of the questions I would raise for the committee is, is the safest position from a litigation point of view, the, the goal that you want, or is it what's best for Vermonters as the goal that you want? And the health and safety um, aspect and the choice to create a legalized market um, the choice to make it a legal market 
rather than just small amounts of private use, um, was very deliberately focused on both the black market and the safety of and quality of what somebody was buying. Um, it, it was not a public policy decision that, um, that as a general statement, it's, it's a good or healthy thing. We were not uh, setting out as a public policy that we want to see uh, more people using uh, or, or more access in general. We wanted access to be safe. We wanted the black market to be um, cut back. So, so I think that that affects um, the reason, the policy choice uh, to allow sales in, in contrast to uh, just small personal growing. And therefore it is not more than necessary uh, to support the key public policy health and safety goals. Um, and obviously that's a court that will determine that. But again, I think that uh, in terms of what's the best way to support our choice in passing this litigation, our rationale uh, in terms of protecting uh, Vermonters. Um, and I do recognize that drawing that line uh, between encouraging increased consumption, which is really the focus and, and maybe adding the word increased as opposed to encouraging consumption would help clarify it. I, I realize it's a difficult line. Um, certainly promoting the benefits of one's own retail establishment or one's own quality of product um, is challenging to draw a perfect line between uh, that specific goal and um, increasing consumption. Because obviously you are, in, you are increasing consumption if people come to your store. I think that's where legislative council came to suggesting, uh, talking about for a particular uh, licensee. Um, so uh, calculated to induced uh, sales um, for a particular licensee is permitted um, under the definition of, of advertising. Um, and, and that's trying to help draw that line, but ultimately it's gonna be the rulemaking process that's gonna to have to, to spell that out. Um, I mean, I think drawing the line and articulating what constitutes overconsumption, is that based on what's overconsumption for an individual um, or for the population as a whole? Um, I think that's a challenge too, and that's why it's a part of the rulemaking process to, to identify exactly what that would mean in terms of advertising. So likewise, um, talking about encouraging an increase in consumption uh, would have to be the fine tuning uh, and the uh, effort to uh, avoid a sustainable legal challenge would end up having to be in the, in the rulemaking process, but this sets the intended parameters of, um, of how one addresses um, advertising um, and avoiding that promotion of increased use. Representative Gannon. Um. Um, first of all, th thank you, Representative Donahue, for presenting this amend amendment. I think it's a very thoughtful amendment. Um, and, and so I, I guess I I'm posing the question you sort of raised, um, or at least I thought you raised in your, your, your statement, about if we did change this to encourage increased consumption, um, you know, does the Assistant Attorney General believe that that might change um, the result under the Central Hudson test? And then I have another follow-up question. These are, you know, I'm answering on the spot here um, in terms of hadn't considered this under the central Hudson, hadn't considered this language under the central Hudson test. Um, but if we think our way through it, again, I think that there, 
is a couple issues here and Representative Donahue, I think, spoke to both of them. One is sure, there's always gonna be some challenge around how you apply these things in practical cases. Um, and, and that will be true of the current regulation too. But, said it, but then there's also additionally, and I think it's somewhat different actually, and they overlap, but it's somewhat different. There's also the question of whether or not the restriction can be tied tightly enough to the public policy interest at stake. Uh, and so for example, the way the language is currently um, drafted, it says promote over, you know, won't promote overconsumption. I think that that is reason, well, there's an argument to be made that that's reasonably related to a public health concern. And we were worried about encourages consumption because that's, that's legal now. And, um, it, you know, that would, that would be something that you're saying, well, uh, there's a policy where we're, we made this policy and now we're also trying to sort of counteract it at the same time. And I think that a court would find that tension to effectively be in violation of um, the prong four around, is it tied to, um, you know, is it, is it not over, is it not overly extensive? Uh, so that is, my winding way of getting to your uh, suggestion there around the increased consumption. And I, I, again, I think that that would be, that, that I do think is a tying together of the two problems here, which is that how would a court decide what increased consumption is who, who for, um, you know, is it a singular question? Is it overconsumption? Is it increased consumption by one person? Is it overconsumption by the pop or sorry, increased consumption by the population in general? Um, and it, it, and how, how is that measurable? And how would the board apply that in a way that isn't arbitrary? Uh, and I think that you would likely end up at, you know, any advertising that uh, tries to increase sales for an establishment is all is potentially not increasing consumption, right? Because it could just be shifting sales from an illegal market to a legal market, um, or it could be, you know, selling to people who have moved to Vermont and used elsewhere. So any of the advertising could be seen to be um, not in violation of that, or any of the advertising could be seen to be in violation of it because it could be increasing sales to some, but to the same user who's now using more or to the, uh, the, the existing population that's using more. And I think because it becomes essentially sort of impossible to apply and it, and it could be applied in a way that uh, again, essentially prevents almost all advertising from going forward. I do think, again, you remain in greater danger under the central Hudson prong four than you do under the current menu, where pieces of those may be challenging to apply in, um, in practicality, but I do think that they have a tighter relationship to the public health concerns. Again, Vermont has decided that consumption in general is not a sufficient public health concern to ban the consumption of it. Uh, but they have, they are still saying that we are worried about some of the more narrow issues around overconsumption and so forth. Um, and it's also possible that increasing consumption by an individual from a tiny bit to a little bit actually is not a public health concern. And now I'm outside of my sort of public health expertise, but I think a court might find that that's the case. So I think that even that is still, you're painting with a very broad brush, one that could be seen to have to have actually no, um, it could range all the way from having no practical uh, enforcement effect to having a complete sort of blanket uh, inability to advertise. And so I think that that, again, it runs into danger on its face of just being overruled by Central Hudson. We do think that the menu is a safer way, and, and I should say this, safer from the standpoint of leaving Vermont with the ability to have rational regulations in place that are related to public safety. And that's what I mean by when I say safe, it's a litigation standpoint safe. I understand Representative Vani, who's making a point about um, public safety and health, public health and safety as well. Um, so that, that's sort of where we still fall back on the menu of options is a safer lit 
stance litigation wise, these broad brush applications um, are more likely to run into trouble, especially because they could be applied very, very broadly. Okay, thank you for so, the ability of a licensee to know exactly how that's going to play out. So I'm going to put you on the spot again, David. Um, and I, I don't even know if this would be acceptable to Representative Donahue. Uh, however, what, what if we change the language from encourages consumption to shows consumption? What? Show. So you can see somebody smoking, you know. Uh, you know, cannabis or, you know, or using or using edibles, um, th there, that could not appear in the advertisement. W would that change your analysis at all? Uh, again, I think that runs into a similar issue. And I, these are tough. I mean, could showing, you know, maybe right now showing consumption is something that's depending on how it's done could particularly appeal to youth, right? So some of these ideas could be captured, some of these problems could be captured under current proposed regulations. But let's put that aside. I mean, I think that again, we're running into this challenge where a court is likely to say, hey, you, the state of Vermont, said that consumption is legal. You certainly do have policy interests in preventing bad health outcomes. But consumption itself, you've decided, is not a sufficiently uh, dangerous thing that it needs to be completely illegal. And so I think that I'm not. I think that you still are going to run into over, you know, overly extensive regulation problems uh, with respect to the prong four analysis. Okay. Thank you. So, committee, um, we are due uh, in the floor at some point soon. Um, so are there any other questions either for the proposer of the amendment or for uh, from the Attorney General's perspective on the Donahue Amendment? All right, um, Representative Donahue, um, briefly final comments here. Yes, I, I just want to, um, again, I, I understand that consumption is, is legal um, or as was just said, consumption is not completely illegal. But I don't think that that means that the state believes that health and safety uh, is not at risk through consumption as with other, other substances that are regulated. Um, I think they're, I think the state is saying it's at health and safety is at risk for any user. It's just that it's, it, we don't want to make it completely legal. We want to make it legal because of the benefits of uh, the, the harm reduction of um, illicit sales and therefore safety in the product. So, so I really think the tie is there. If you were talking only about children, you wouldn't have the tie. Um, I also think, as I mentioned before, I think promotes overconsumption is even a lot vaguer, particularly. I, encourages increased consumption is probably a more accurate way of, my, of describing my intent. So that would make, in, make sense. That's what I uh, meant by encouraging uh, uh, increased consumption. But what I think the vagueness uh, issue is is worse with um, with overconsumption. So um, I guess really that's just my my final comment. I would really urge the committee to consider it as a as a balancing um, that does not um, completely uh, ban advertising at all. Um, I think the uh, rulemaking process can ensure that because the intent of the legislature is clear. Uh, that there is not a desire to ban all advertising. Um, so I, I would leave it at that. I, I would, uh, because it came up about being the initial house position, I would really urge the committee, and if you wanted it in, in the form of another amendment for me, to go back to the health warnings position that the house had, you had originally, that has been left out in this. And that was you asked for input from the health care committee. Uh, we requested that the warnings be done by the health department, not by the board. 
in consultation. Uh, that's the same as, you know, it's the Surgeon General on cigarettes. It's not, um, you know, a, a, a group that um, includes assorted interests. It's a health interest only. Um, so I might as well throw that pitch in. It made me think about it because of the reference to this is the same as the um, prior house position. Um, and that had been our standard for labels on cannabis for symptom relief. And that was also uh, removed, I think, unintentionally in the process of the conference committee back and forth. Representative LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I um, Maybe to try to draw this to some sort of conclusion here, I'm going to end up supporting this amendment for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, I've always been a little troubled by the advertising component to this. I don't think that the state was ever intended or for us to get in the position of trying to promote or encourage increased use. So my feeling about advertising is always it needs to be somewhat limited to be more informative than it is to, I guess, for the ultimate use to um, in, incur increased usage for one, two. Um, you know, this is only a problem if it gets challenged. And it is my understanding, like the tobacco industry and others, there's uh, an agreement that, you know, what the, the lay of the land is the lay of the land here. And I'll remind the committee here that things like campaign finance, um, and if I remember correctly, the GMO labeling are all things that, you know, we felt strongly about, did get challenged, came back and got addressed uh, different ways. And it is my understanding that we've given the Cannabis Control Board some latitude here to go through and address some of these issues as they kind of pop up and need to be dealt with. So um, I, for one, am looking to support this amendment and encourage the rest of the committee to do it as well. Well, while we're in the process of weighing in how we feel, because um, I think it will help us get to a conclusion on this, um, I want to say that I am uncomfortable with this language. Um, you know, there are certainly are um, consumables out there that are unhealthy. Uh, think bacon triple cheeseburger. Um, there are retail products available that indeed are um, prohibited for youth use, uh, such as uh, alcohol. And, um, and yet we don't see uh, this kind of a restriction being placed on those commercial um, products or, or speech around those commercial products. And so I, um, I am not comfortable with this. And, um, and I'm also cognizant of the time. It is now 10.15. Um, are there any other committee questions for um, either the sponsor of this amendment or um, the Attorney General's office before we go to a vote? Representative Hooper. Sorry, Madam Chair, we'll leave this to, to the last minute, but I don't even know if I'm looking at the current uh, copy of the bill, but on 2592, there are seven sections to this advertising policy. If that still exists, David, it's your position that if we change one of them, we might throw Central Hudson into a mix where they all would vanish? Is that, or the specific number two that we're talking about now? Well, uh, Representative, let me make sure I answer your question correctly. So my understanding, um, hang on one second. How about you and I can just talk? And yeah, that. sorry. I, I just wanted to, before I answer your question, I wanted to take another look at the precise language to make sure I answered your question correctly. Um, but if it isn't going to change your vote, if it is going to be something that's essential to your vote, I can take a minute and look at it carefully. If it isn't, then um, uh, we can connect after. Well, I see can, Michelle. Pop. Can I add a, a clarification? If, if everything was thrown out, the legislature could always go back and enact new legislation that uh, would more comport with the parts that hadn't been challenged, as Washington State uh, could and was urged by the court to do so. Am I right about that? That connects with the question being asked.
Um, Michelle Childs, did you want to uh, weigh in with some clarification here? I was just going to point David to it's an 864 and 978 in subsection B in the subdivisions one through seven that he's referencing. So this being the only the change to, to B2. Yeah, that's right, Representative Hooper. And uh, my apologies if I was clear on that. I think I was referencing some earlier arguments I'd made last time around the, the broader um, effect. But yes, that, that would be the piece that would be uh, so we would not essentially be left threadbare in terms of regulating advertising. We would only be eliminating the ability to say you can't do this particular thing. Yeah, I believe that that, yeah, I think what you're saying is correct. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Again, my apology for asking that so late. I asked Michelle in the chat. Representative Yehovsky. Thanks. I just want to clarify that the current restrictions are sort of in line with alcohol and tobacco advertising restrictions. Yes. I am. <laughs> that's a really big question because alcohol and uh, tobacco advertising restrictions are, are huge and they also have different sources of authority for them. So Tobacco, for example, some of the restrictions come from the master settlement agreement in the 90s, which isn't something that the companies can appeal, you know, they've agreed to it, they can't bring it to court anymore. So it's sort of outside of this First Amendment framework. And some of the alcohol restrictions, I think, have actually been um, basically acceded to by uh, companies. So I think agreed to by companies or so anyway, I think that it, I say all that by way of saying at the very sort of strict First Amendment analysis that we've applied to this isn't analogous to the tobacco and alcohol situation. So there may they may be different in important ways, but that doesn't mean that the same legal analysis is applicable. Okay, thank you. Um, my other question is, if we were to enact some form of this amendment, would that make our advertising restrictions the strictest in the states that have legalized cannabis use and sales? And maybe you don't know the answer to that. <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable answering okay. unless I'd done a very like clear, full survey of the states that have a fully legalized market. Okay, thanks. Representative Pigley. Thank you, Madam Chair. To move this along, I'd like to make a motion that we approve this amendment with further amendment by adding the word increased. So it would read encourages increased consumption. Folks understand what we're looking at here. Um, I think it probably makes sense to do this in a two-step fashion. I am willing to find that as friendly, if that helps. It does. I'm just trying to figure out whether we should amend your amendment and then vote on whether to accept it as amended. Um, let's, uh, let's. I, I would be willing to met, to amend my own proposal, not. Okay. Not require two steps. All right. So the question before the committee um, on a motion from Rep Higley is, um, is whether to uh, amend the bill as offered by the member from Northfield. And, um, and while I appreciate the effort to, um, to thread the needle, so to speak, I, I will not be supporting this amendment. I think, uh, I think that we have uh, done some really hard work uh, with respect to crafting um, advertising restrictions that uh, you know that that meet the legal standard and I'm not comfortable making uh, this last minute amendment. Um, anyone else want to speak to this before we go to Rep Colston for a roll call? Rep Behovsky. Thank you. I really want to say how much I appreciate this conversation and while I absolutely am 
in favor of really threading this needle. I don't feel like I have the information that I need in this moment to support this, this last minute change. And so I'm very supportive and would love to keep having this conversation and really fine tuning this. But I just, I feel like I have so many questions that are left unanswered to, to move forward at this point. So I am in agreement with, yeah, this is, this was a, this is a tough call for me. All right, Representative Gannon. Um, thank you, and I, I really do appreciate the representative, Representative Donahue's amendment. However, I do think we should follow the guidance of the Attorney General's office um, with respect to this, especially given the short time we've had with it. Um, uh, we did spend a lot of time um, in the last biennium working on these advertising um, prohibitions and restrictions, and I do think they are some of the most restrictive in the country, um, especially our restriction that, you know, advertisements cannot be seen by no more than 15% of people under the age of 21. Um, I, I think we did, and, and I also should note that, you know, the Cannabis Control Board will have, have an opportunity to add a lot of flavor um, to these restrictions and prohibitions through rulemaking. And we will have an opportunity to review that rulemaking um, when it's done. Representative Hooper. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I concur. I last session was in the camp that said no advertising outside the building. And, uh, you know, it is late in the process. I have some degree of faith in the Cannabis Commission doing the right thing. If not, we can come back and tighten things up at some point. Um, I, I'll be just moving forward on this. Thanks. All right, Representative Colston, take it away. I shall begin the roll call. Gannon. Gannon? No. Thank you. Mariki? No. LeClaire? Yes. Hooper? No. Colston? No. Anthony? No. Mihovsky? No. Lefebvre? Yes. Higley? Yes. McCarthy? No. Copeland Hanses? No. The vote is three yes, eight no. The amendment does not go forward. Uh, thank you to the Assistant Attorney General for being with us on this this morning, and thank you, um, Representative Donahue, for your uh, for your time this morning. Uh, we have several other amendments we need to um, take care of, and so I'm going to go next to the Gannon Amendment, which is um, requiring the Criminal Justice Council to bring back a a, a timeline and the and a report on the funds necessary to achieve our um, A-RIDE objectives. Um, I believe that Representative Anthony made a motion on that. I did indeed. I move that we find it favorable. All right, Representative Colston, when you're ready. I shall begin the roll call. Gannon. Yes. Mariki. Yes. Declare. Yes. Hooper. Yes. Colston. Yes. Anthony. Yes. Piotrowski. Yes. Lefebvre. Yes. Higley. Yes. McCarthy. Yes. Copeland Hanses. Yes. The vote is 11 0 0. Find it favorable. Thank you. Next up, we have the House Ways and Means Amendment uh, that was brought to us. It feels like a couple hours ago, <laughs> <laughs> but I think it was only one hour ago um, by uh, Representative Beck on behalf of the Ways and Means Committee. Representative Anthony. I wonder, Madam Chair, if we can separate it. I, I anticipate, or my own view is that 
I agree with Representative Beck in Ways and Means about the integrated license. Just say it's 50,000 and, and, and not mess around with percentages. I, however, also agree with the uh, sentiment I think evinced, namely to roll in the advertising fee with the license fee with some sort of suitable language so that we, but, but again, that, that, that bifurcates essentially the proposal from Ways and Means. I'm, I'm not sure how to tidily do that, but um, anyway, that's where I am. Thanks. I don't disagree with you on that. Um, and, I, and I think it's worth, um, it's worth acknowledging that we'll need a little more guidance from the Cannabis Control Board with respect to how much time and expense is involved on their behalf in terms of approving advertising. Um, the, it, you know, it may very well be that the Cannabis Control Board says, you know, the fairest way to do this is to have, you know, a, a fee schedule, and this is what we think the fee schedule ought to be. Um, I hate to set up a dynamic where we have a, a, a fight between committees on the floor of the House on this, particularly since um, it, is, uh, it is very directly in the realm of the Ways and Means Committee to, um, you know, to make changes to the bill with respect to fees. So I, I think I would like us to acknowledge that we wanna flag this and ask the question in January when we see a fee report. Um, but I, I guess I, um, I don't wanna set up a dynamic where we accept half of their amendment and then spend some hours fighting about something that, uh, that isn't gonna go into effect until um, the fees are adopted next January anyway. Representative LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm, I'm going to support this amendment, but one of these kind of reluctantly, I, I'm disappointed that they made the changes that they made and that it's going to require them to come in off session to address these issues. The Cannabis Control Board folks made it quite clear that they had timelines that they needed to adhere to. And I just don't agree with the process here, but I am going to support it. Thank you. Um, so a motion on the floor here to accept the Ways and Means Amendment. I move to accept the House Ways and Means Amendment. Thank you. Um, and thank you to Representative Anthony for flagging this and uh, Representative LeClaire, I, I share your, um, your reluctance and um, but I too will be supporting this amendment. Um, Rep. Colston, when you're ready. I shall call the roll. Gannon. Yes. Marwicki. Yes. McClare. Yes. Cooper. Yes. Colston. Yes. Anthony. Yes. Bihoski. Yes. Lefebvre. No. Higley. No. McCarthy. Yes. Copeland Hanses. Yes. Nine two zero. We find it favorable. All right. Cruising into home here on the Peterson Amendment. Um, and I I guess what I want to say about um, about my thoughts on this is that it was um, it was a very strong theme within the House Government Operations Committee during the development of this bill that given that cannabis um, is legal in Vermont um, and given that uh, we want a legal enterprise to be able to be set up and uh, and encourage folks who may currently be in growing in an illicit market to enter the legal market that we wanted to make sure that um, that that the majority of the license types were not able to be restricted and creating a patchwork of um, of commercial enterprise around the state um, because if I own some land in West Fairley and West Fairley um, 
was given the ability to to restrict my ability to use that land for a legal commercial enterprise, um, it it sets up a lot of worries in my mind about how uh, how effective we will be as a state at um, discouraging uh, the illicit market and bringing folks into the regulated marketplace. And and we made an exception with that for retail, really, because um, because retail could have a, a, a much greater impact on the uh, on the traffic patterns in a community, on um, on the number of people coming and going in a community, and we felt that retail was um, was a, a slightly higher impact uh, part of the cannabis industry, and we wanted communities to be able to um, to opt in or opt out on that. And so I will not be supporting the um, Peterson Amendment and. Um, so representative Anthony, do you want to weigh in on that? Uh, only to go a little bit further. I, I just lowered my hand because you pretty much said it. I would point out that with the exception of the retail license, virtually all the other iterations and supply chains are regional in nature. And as soon as you start dismembering the regional, uh, uh, if you will, fabric, you run in, you raise all kinds of other uh, unintended consequences. So I, I support your position entirely. Thanks. Other committee members, uh, Representative LeClaire. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I unfortunately missed the better part of the presentation around this amendment, which I do apologize for. But um, as much as I do think it's a very worthy conversation, and there are certainly some concerns out there, um, one of my concerns about this would be is what about the communities that have already gone ahead and had affirmative votes one way or the other? It's my last understanding that we're in the in the twenties now of communities that have already acted on this. And, you know, is there anything retroactive about this? And the other part of this is I believe we had robust discussion around the fact that most of this would fall underneath local zoning anyway. And there mm -hmm. is language in there to address some of those issues that maybe the local zoning won't as far as like size and screening and things like that. So um, as much as I do appreciate it coming forward um, at this particular junction, because we are so far down the road, I, I can't support it. All right, seeing no other hands, Representative Colston. I shall begin the roll call. Gannon? No. Mariki? No. McClare? No. Hooper? No. Colston? No. Anthony? No. Behovsky? No. Lefebvre? Yes. Higley? Yes. McCarthy? No. Copeland Hansis. No. The vote is two nine zero. <clears throat> we find the amendment unfavorable. All I'd right. just like to thank the committee for your uh, consideration. Thank you very much for taking the time. Thank you Appreciate for being it. with us this morning, Representative Peterson. Um, thank you, Ledge Council, for um, for hanging in and helping us understand um, a variety of um, amendments that have come before us this morning and. We will uh, be dashing off to the floor at this point. So that is it for committee for this morning and I'll see you all on the floor.